You are listening to a Sustainable World Radio podcast. Sustainable World Radio brings you in-depth interviews, news, and commentary about exciting, creative, and innovative ways of living. Produced in Santa Barbara, California, Sustainable World focuses on positive solutions to environmental challenges, solutions that adhere to the permaculture ethics, earth care, people care, fair share. Are you interested in learning more about permaculture projects around the globe? How to plant a food forest? Restorative design or ethnobotany? Then stay tuned to Sustainable World Radio. I'm Jill Cloutier. Our topic today is food sheds, and I'm joined in studio this morning with Carrie Clough and Owen Dell, and Jacob Rodrigue will be joining us um, on the phone a little bit later on. And if you're like me, you may be a little unsure of what a food shed actually is, and in the next hour, we'll have a chance to learn about food sheds, local food sheds that are happening in Santa Barbara, and also how to start a food shed in your own neighborhood. So welcome, Owen and Carrie. Thank you. Thanks, Jill. And let me give an intro to my guest today. Owen Dell is the owner of County Landscape and Design, and you may have heard him in an interview. Owen, you've actually been on the show a couple times with an interview I did at your house, and then also as Dr. Sigmund Vroom. Ah, yes. Yes. That was a very popular piece that I played. Um, Owen, we'll talk about that a little bit later. He's he's an actor and a performance artist, as well as the li- is a licensed landscape contractor and landscape architect who specializes in sustainable landscapes, firescaping, and native landscaping. And then Carrie Clough is a personal chef, nutritionist, who prepares lo- organic, local, and seasonal cuisine in a beautiful way. Carrie is trained as a nutritional chef. She is a, has her own personal chef business called Manzanita, and Carrie is a passionate ecologist, gardener, and avid reader, and she has a lot to share with us today about food and food sheds. And Jacob Rodri will be joining us on the phone in a little while, and he's a certified permaculturist, gardening, and farming enthusiast, and Jacob enjoys good, healthy conversation and food. And I've announced his food shed gatherings on the show a lot, so we'll get to talk to him um, soon. So welcome to Sustainable World, and let's start with the term food shed. What does that actually mean? And I don't know if, Owen, if you want to start with that. Uh, Yeah, actually, it's interesting. When I started this uh, program locally, I I researched the word, and it turns out it goes back to 1929, uh, and it basically describes the path of food from where it's grown to where it's eaten, similar to a watershed. Interesting. So it's basically you kind of trace where the food's grown and then where it ends up. Yes, and how far it goes and what it, what it goes through to get from here to there. And are most of the food sheds in the U.S., is, is, they're pretty large, aren't they? Well, you know, you, you hear this quote that the average uh, meal travels 1,500 miles from farm to plate. Um, Michael Polan in his book Omnivore's Dilemma talks about the fact that it costs 52 calories of energy to ship one calorie of lettuce uh, from the West Coast to the East Coast. So a lot of our food travels very far, and that makes our system very energy inefficient, fossil fuel dependent, and rather fragile. And when did you, when you first heard this term food shed on, what prompted you to to get involved here locally in this um, action? Well, as a, as a landscape architect and contractor, I've spent my life uh, changing the land and working with the land. And I have always been disturbed by the fact that most of what we do with our suburban properties is plant ornamental uh, plants around them. And there's nothing wrong with that up to a point. But I, uh, you, you have to realize that we live on some of the best farmland in the world. We have a fantastic climate for growing food. And we simply have to ask the question, why aren't we growing more food uh, around our own properties uh, where there is no fossil fuel input and we get fresh, free, uh, or at least very inexpensive organic food right out of our own backyards. So I got very interested in this, and uh, about a year ago I decided that it was time to do something about it, having finally gone through the permaculture uh, design course, and uh, I thought I'd start something in Santa Barbara. It's great, and it seems like it's really taken off. There's actually a website now for one of the food sheds. Yeah, there's a food shed on the Mesa called the Mesa Exchange, and they have a really nice website. It's got a dreadfully long website. uh, URL. I don't know if you want me to give it out, but it's one of those long-winded ones. Um, you could probably just Google Mesa Exchange Food Shed Santa Barbara and get to the same place. They're doing a really good job. We actually have two active food sheds now, uh, one in um, Veronica Springs Hidden Valley area, which is what Jacob and Carrie are doing, and then the one on the Mesa. 
Now, Carrie, how did you get involved in um, this in food sheds? Well, I think that um, it, it's important to mention the um, organic garden group that listserv that um, there's hundreds of us that have signed up, and um, it's actually where. Um, I started seeing Owen quite a bit. I'd, I'd met him previously, and it, w and it was nice to run into him at all these different meetings. And he was actually, he and Larry and um, Linda Saltzman have been instrumental in getting this, this idea out to the public and kind of creating a, a forum where people can talk about it and, and think about some possibilities. And, you know, and Owen created this great um, this brochure, or I guess we call it a flyer, that really kind of details, um, you know, how much we're wasting um, I, I think another way of looking at it too is it's another form of waste management. I mean, I mean that's the, the maybe not the most appropriate term, but um, I mean thinking about all the food that we waste and you know really looking at, at the unsustainability of a lot of our um, of our food system, especially here in the states with you know mass agriculture and um, you know everyone's talking about peak oil and peak water. Well, well, what about peak food? I mean that's something we need to consider. And so. Um, Jacob and I just kind of, you know, Owen, Owen and, and Larry just kind of set the ball rolling, and we were both were really passionate about it. And Jacob has um, a beautiful garden with, with lots of different things growing it, and he thought, well, why don't I just start doing it at my house? And, um, and it's been a great, you know, resource. And then, you know, meeting more people from the community who have come forth and, you know, have shared things. And, and it really isn't about, you know, having things to share. It's just about coming and and supporting something that's that's a it's a very community, you know, a community gathering. Yeah, it definitely sounds very very grassroots. And what I loved about it was it it sounds like from the literature that I got from Owen's website, it's a food shed is a local food production and distribution system set up among immediate neighbors. So it kind of takes out a lot of the middlemen that that you know our food is grown on these mega farms. So we can really be more in control of what we're eating. Well, that's true, and um, getting it back to, to what is local is so important, not only on an environmental level and a food level, but on a social level uh, and really an economic level. And so the idea that we're pursuing here locally is to create a food shed of maybe 8 to 10 square blocks and um, go in and evaluate the uh, neighborhood for what's there now. Uh, the size of the food shed is within walking distance. Everybody can actually literally carry their food to the distribution point, um, get people to buy into the system, um, begin to come to a food share, what this term has sort of bubbled up, the food share, which is what uh, Carrie and Jacob are doing and are happening on the Mesa. It's kind of stage one. You bring the stuff that you're already growing and you, you share it and the kids come and play and people get to know each other. It's really a lot of fun. And then stage two, which I'm hoping people will begin to take up, is to then go in and evaluate the neighborhood for what's missing and begin to tune it up for a balanced diet so that in the end you have as much of the total diet, uh, dietary needs uh, for the neighborhood that you can possibly develop within the neighborhood. That's, it. That's almost like designing a plan to feed yourselves. It's kind of yeah. landscape architecture combined with permaculture, combined with farming, and making, yeah, making a system that you and your neighbors can uh, utilize and enjoy and uh, make the best use of all this wonderful land that we have around our houses. Because really, you know, what I think is that the old, old suburban dream that began in the early part of the 20th century and uh, accelerated, of course, in the 50s, 60s, 70s, was to have a house with a little bit of land around it. And unfortunately, we stopped doing the agricultural thing with that land and started doing all these lawns and ornamentals, and it got perverted. And I think it's time to bring it back to what I, what I believe was the original dream of the suburbs. And I really think that the suburbs could be our greatest hope rather than our greatest problem. Definitely. And, and Owen, what could this kind of reminds me of our permaculture course. I took a permaculture course, too, where the teacher actually had us make an inventory in our neighborhood of all the fruit trees and edibles in the neighborhood. So is this part, it sounds like a part of a permaculture idea where you actually are inventorying what's there and then you go from there? Well, yeah, it, it actually, it is permaculture. Uh, whether you wish to call it that or not, it doesn't really make any difference. But um, yeah, looking at what you have, resources and needs, um, sharing the resources and filling in the needs and meeting those needs. Uh, when I did that inventory, uh, just on my own property, I found I had 130 varieties of edible plants, and it shocked me completely. That's amazing. I had about two varieties of agapanthas. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to have to uh, do a little work on your place. 
<laughs> I'm a renter. Darn it. Okay. But anyway, so Carrie, what about you? Have you um, been involved in permaculture at all, or is it more from your background as a nutritional chef? Um, it's more the, the my knowledge of permaculture is is mostly peripheral. Um, you know, from Owen and, and Jacob, I've certainly learned quite a bit, and um, I think what it is, it's 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 looking at natural systems and working with nature rather than against it. And I think that what's great about the whole food shed concept is it's it's really trying to look at at efficiency in terms of rather than than time efficiency, rather than feeling like well, I really need that you know that that orange juice from the store, I can, you know, run down and drive my car down, you know, to the grocery store and get it. Well, wouldn't it be great if you could, you know, go to your neighbors and, or, you know, they have an orange tree. I mean, just kind of, I really think I'm passionate about, about local. Um, and I think local food, you know, especially the food that's grown in the soil where, you know, we, we live and we, and we grow is, has a, a nutritional superiority. I mean, maybe that sounds elitist, but, um, it's really not about that. It's kind of about, about building community, I think that's where so much of, of, of nutrition and health is, you know, plays a key role. I think that um, I actually just wrote an article for Edible Ojai entitled, um, you know, building community moving from organic to, to local. And I think, um, and that's actually a great um, periodical if anyone's ever, if you want to look at it online. It's a quarterly publication that they really, they really emphasize um, local and sustainable foods. It's great. And, um, I think, you know, with the organic movement, um, it's, it's especially, I mean, that's, if you think about it, it started in the 70s with the CCOF and creating a, you know, system of standards and this, this non-chemical, you know, anti-revolution to the chemical revolution, um, just kind of looking at, a, you know, way of growing food naturally. Well, you know, it's, it's taken on a new marketing level that has kind of perverted the whole sense of what, what a lot of us feel organic means. I think that, um, you know, food that's grown without chemicals naturally, not about high yields, but about kind of, you know, and then working with the seasons as well. I think that that's, you know, really, really important nutritionally. Um, so that's that's where I come in um, and my passion. And, it, you know, this reminds me a lot of City Repair. I don't know if oh, any yeah. of you yeah, heard yeah. of Mark, Mark Lakeman. Lakeman or, yeah. yeah, that's what it reminds me of. Now, Owen, would you say that any urban neighborhood could be converted to, and I think, I don't know if this is your term, but I loved it, is it a nosh-sphere? Nosh, how do you say it? <laughs> I had to look. I remember having to look at that a few times. <laughs> Did I pronounce it right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have to plead guilty to that one. That's I love it. Sort of like Yiddish food shed uh, kind of thing. Uh, <laughs> well, uh, you know, we have urban neighborhoods and suburban neighborhoods. There's a lot of... Um, talk and, and activity in planning circles these days around high density. And um, I really have mixed feelings about it. It's a very long side discussion that I won't get into. But uh, the more density you have, the less land you have. Uh, it does have some advantages if you're willing to use public transportation and keep workplaces close to homes and all that. But um, uh, it really begins to put a, a, a cramp in the style of the whole food shed idea. Now, I have food growing on my roof. Uh, which is a thing that people can do. But um, generally speaking, I think the greatest hope uh, and my greatest enthusiasm is out in the suburbs because everybody's got north, south, east, and west exposures around their house. Most of the suburbs in this country are built on former farmland. Uh, it's sitting there basically going to waste while we're you know, destroying natural areas to create mega farms that don't really make any sense, and then ship the food halfway across the country. So I think this really brings it, literally brings the whole food system home where it should be. I realize that we can't grow 100% of everything, but if you could get together with your neighbors and uh, say, hey, you do the chickens, and I'll, do, I'll put in the peaches, and somebody's going to have to take care of the broccoli or the tilapia in the pond in the backyard, you could begin to get a really good food system going just in a local area. And so I think the suburbs are really where this can become uh, fully flowered, so to speak. What I like about this, too, is that you don't have to grow everything. If you specialize in growing a certain thing, then you have that to offer. Well, yeah. yeah, exactly. I mean, uh, um, some people are going to get into the whole permaculture, organic gardening thing, and try to grow every last possible thing. But one of the things that I thought was interesting in the permaculture course was the idea that, hey, this is not about being a survivalist, uh, you know, putting a uh, razor wire fence around your property and trying to, <laughs> trying to live and keep the hordes out. This is about cooperating with your neighbors, creating community, 
And then even people who maybe aren't particularly interested in gardening can surely learn to grow fig trees or, uh, you know, whatever it might be in a one-off crop. And that's their role. That's their contribution. Or even if they're elderly or too busy to grow something, uh, they can allow their land to be used and shared uh, with the group. Now, Owen and Carrie, how did you first start your food shed? Was it just inventorying your neighborhood, like you said, in your own property, Owen, which had an amazing amount of um, edibles on it? And then did you approach neighbors? What were their first responses when you brought this up? Well, I'm going to turn this over to Carrie in a second because she's really got the best story, I think. But, um, you know, I got interested in this. I began to talk to people about it. And then the, the catalyzing moment for me was when a client who happens to live a few blocks from my house sent me an email and said, you know, I really have a lot of lemons and once in a while I'll get extra food. Is there any way that you know of where I could share that with anybody? And so I sent him back a lengthy email and kind of dumped on him and uh, he was pretty shocked when I basically drafted him into the army of one <laughs> to be the first um, food shed uh, creator in Santa Barbara. And Little did he know little the lemons know. would lead him into a new And <laughs> he went out and began to talk to neighbors and kind of got into it after an initial sort of reticence. And I gave him some pep talks. And uh, he and his family are really nice people. And so they've created uh, what is now the Mesa Exchange and has become a really lively food shed. But at about the same time or a little afterwards, Carrie and Jacob and I were at, I forget what lecture it was, some permaculture thing or something, and we came out into the parking lot, and, well, I'll let you tell the rest of the story. You guys kind of thought this up on your own, I think. Was it right after the talk that you and Larry Saltzman? It, it might have been, yeah. Yeah, um, which really was, you know, um, Linda, I mean, Linda and Larry uh, and Owen's way of kind of presenting to the community a way of, of, of talking about this and I remember we went we did go out to dinner after and we had all these different ideas about how to go about this and um, you know it wouldn't it wasn't about stepping on you know anyone's toes stepping on farmers toes or you know the farmers market it's actually it's actually enhancing the whole concept and um, and really um, you know Jacob you know has this amazing backyard and we just thought well this is a this is a perfect opportunity to kind of open it up and um, and kind of see what happens from there and start sharing. And it really isn't about, you know, having to have um, produce or, or anything in particular to bring. I mean, it's really about just people coming and sharing, and you really, it's not this elitist thing, so. Uh-huh. Yeah, that's great. That's good to know, because I think some people feel like they have to have this amazing garden and have to know how to grow all these different things to participate in something like this. You know, it's it's partly about food. It's also about fun and people and um, the Mesa Food Shed, uh, kids come and they, they make lemonade and orange juice for people and they play and the adults get to know each other and they have a tour of whoever's hosting the food share that day. And so y- you don't need to bring anything but yourself and, and a smile and uh, a willingness to chat a little bit, talk about what variety these peaches are and all that and share recipes. And, it sounds wonderful. You know, it's wonderful. only partly about food. It sounds great. You know, it really is so much more hopeful for me to hear about this um, vision for the suburbs as opposed to the end of suburbia video. Did any of you see that? Did either of you see that? I haven't seen that. Have you seen that? Yeah, I saw it. And uh, didn't you feel like you'd been run over by a truck afterwards? Yeah. um, I mean, he's, he did a a good service, but uh, but... he and I are, I think temperamentally on opposite sides (laughs) of the, of the fence. And I, um, it was just like, it's over. Why not just yeah, end it finished. now? Let's yeah, we're finished. Let's just go die, as Larry Santoyo <laughs> says. You know, why don't we just go die now? Well, and I'm, I'm so sorry. I live in the suburb. And, I'm so sorry. You know, sorry. my thing is not without a fight here, folks. You mm-hmm. know, and I'm not giving up like that. So uh, let's take that, you know, terrible uh, apocalyptic vision of his <laughs> and see what we can make out of it. Uh, we've got houses. We've got land. We've got the potential for a beautiful system here. And all we have to do is reinvent it. And it's not that hard, and I think we'll really have something that might actually approach the kind of dream that people had when they began to develop suburbs. A little house, a little land, and some neighbors, and not all jammed into a big, dense city, but not, you know, way out in the country somewhere. It really started out as a um, kind of a middle ground ideal, and it got, it got messed up by consumerism and people going a little bit crazy after World War II and losing their good sense and... We're coming back now. We're reinventing the world, and this is part of it, and I think it really could be something good. Now, one thing I noticed, too, Owen, about the Mesa 
food shed is that it seems like it's kind of sprouted into different, um, there's different branches of this. And it seems like is, there's a free box now. Is it free box Sunday or something? I have it written down somewhere. Yeah, you put yeah. your box out with your stuff and then people can wander the neighborhood and pick things up. And uh, that's been a part of it. And then the food share goes around to different people's houses. And um, uh, then you have this sort of garden tour. So it got a life of its own. And I, I, I really am not, I just am sort of the <laughs> the one who impregnated the idea. And, uh, and the, people are doing whatever they want with it. And the Mesa one has got its own character. And uh, Carrie and Jacobs has its own character. I would like to see, personally, if I were directing this more heavily, I'd like to see people start to tune these neighborhoods and keep it within walking distance. The Mesa one is sort of all over the Mesa, and we end up driving, and that disturbs me a little bit. It's a good start, but I'd like to see more pedestrian-oriented uh, size and scale to this. Owen and Carrie, if you could get into be the first steps in starting a food shed, and I'll try and get Jacob on the phone while you're discussing that. Okay, um, well... Um, I have a brochure, actually, that people can email me and get, and it's the back of the brochure is how does one set up a food shed, and um, it's basically pretty simple. First, you declare yourself the leader, uh, which is always <laughs> easy um, and fun, and then start going around to your neighbors um, door-to-door, preferably with some kind of informational handout um, using the flyer that I have or whatever you want. Talk to people about what a food shed is, what the potential is, what we could be doing in our neighborhood, and then um, see who's interested. Not everybody's going to be interested, obviously. See who, who's willing to get involved, who has food, what kind of food they have. Begin to inventory the neighborhood, see what's there. And then set up a Saturday or Sunday or whatever works for everybody uh, time, a regular time to get together and share the food. That's the beginning. And then as you get to know each other, you can begin to deepen that by tuning the neighborhood for a balanced diet, plugging in crops that are not there uh, at present, and then working on sharing those. That's the basic idea. Um, certainly there are many other permutations on this, like this food, free food box idea that's um, bubbled up on the Mesa. So there are a lot of ways to do it, but that's the basic thing. Go talk to your neighbors, get everybody interested, start to make it happen. It's not very complicated. That means you have to talk to all your neighbors? <laughs> all the ones you can stand to. Even the perfects down the street? <laughs> or, or you can, you know, come to the aforementioned food sheds, and it's a great place to meet people in the community that have a wealth of knowledge already. That, you know, if you just need more tips on what to do, um, you know, it can be daunting for some people. Like, I don't know, I, I want to do it right, you know, and so much of it is just trial and error and, and just, you know, just kind of creating a new concept for your, if you're into gardening, um, just looking at your garden as, as an edible landscape. It can be beautiful, too, if that's something that interests you. Food is definitely beautiful. Now, I think, Jacob, are you on the line right now? Yeah. I'm oh, on, I'm great. Okay, so we are now joined by Jacob Rodriguez, and I hope I'm saying your name correctly. Yeah. J Jacob's a certified permaculturist, gardening, and farming enthusiast, and he enjoys good, healthy conversation and food. And Jacob actually helped, or started a food shed in Santa Barbara. So, Jacob, how did you get involved in this? How did it all start? Yeah. Uh, how did I start it out? Well, like Terry said earlier, uh, Larry and Owen had a talk about it all, the whole concept of what it is and getting it started. And I was like, yeah, that's great. I got oranges falling off my tree right now. You know, let's let's get going and um, pass an email around. And um, I didn't want to really be the, the one that's sit here and talk about this, but, you know, to, to get it all going. But uh, so a, a young man started, said, I'll do it. And I said, he said, okay. And uh, he had particular ideas about it all. And us three started talking about it all, and we're like, well, that's not really what, what we thought of a food shed was, you know. And so I'm like, I have the time. I'm sitting around. I have oranges falling off my tree. So I put an email out saying, come on over and let's sit around and chat. Jacob, you have a very interesting background. And could you tell us a little bit about what you've been studying in the past year or so? Uh, what have I been studying? Uh, a little bit of everything and, and a little bit of nothing, I guess. <laughs> Um, I went and took a permaculture course up at Quail Springs with uh, Darren Doherty and Jeff Lawton, which are great teachers. And um, and then I've also taken a, a couple weekend courses with Paul Stamets, who, uh, if you anything you know about him, he's like the mushroom man or whatever. He's like he's got a book called "Slam Running: How Mushrooms Will Help Save the World," 
<clears throat> and he's he's been a great push in helping get garden and mushrooms and stuff like that. And uh, just been reading a lot, basically, and talking to my elders of the community. And didn't mean to sound bad about <laughs> that, but the <laughs> the people that have much more experience about gardening and farming. I we went to a uh, California Rare Fruit Growers meeting. Me and Carrie and uh, there was a man there that was he was showing us grafting and how you uh, graft graft a, I think it was pear or peach tree sticks. And he probably had more years just just years of grafting. Just the years of experience of grafting, then me and Carrie had life experience under us. You know, he was he was that much of a gentleman. You know, that much older than us. But he, his ability and skill were just, you know, were, were a craftsman, which was you know an, a, thing, a skill that we still need to carry on and learn, so that we have these this you know not a, a ending of all you know situation. Mm -hmm. So we can actually learn from the people who have that knowledge. Yeah, exactly. So what happens at the food sheds at your house? What goes on? Well, we basically <clears throat> set up an old car table my mom had, throw a, a curtain over it, and and uh, go and pick whatever whatever's ripe in the yard and set it out and just sit around and share whatever anybody wants to share. Uh, I've talked to the neighbors, and they don't necessarily have all fruit trees. Uh, my neighbor, he's got a plum tree that's falling plums but we just share and uh whatever people want to bring seeds um for me it's it's been a shed i mean it's been a food shed for for me personally i i've met people i've i've uh i get to hang out with owen a little bit it's um, it is fun to hang out with owen oh exactly you know it's an excuse to i for me i mean i've i met someone one day someone uh suggested you know it was like one person came by and i was like man this is kind of a bummer, but oh well, you know. And he's like, well, you know, there's going to be a beekeeping class. And so, uh, you know, he gave me the number and I called it and I met the guy and I went to the beekeeping class and now I, I've got a hive in the backyard, you know. So, I mean, <laughs> I mean, I don't know if I should be saying that on the air, but yeah, you know, those, those kinds of things kind of happen, you know, and it's just exciting things, you know. And the one person, it was just one person that came by that just made the day, though. That's great. So it's really a great place to learn from each other and share ideas. And like you were talking about the elder person that you were learning about trees from, it's it's a great place for all of us to gather and learn from each other. Yeah, exactly. I mean, yeah. I had the time. I had the place. Let's do it. <sighs> I had the oranges. Let's go. <laughs> Just like the lemons. <laughs> and you're getting the knowledge, it sounds like, too. Oh, yeah, it's been great. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm not going to always be able to do it because there will be other things that I'll, I want to do, but that's the whole, you know, let's get the push out there. Let's get the community rolling. Let's let's all come together and meet and share, you know, because everybody's got a little bit to share. And, Jacob, what has been the response of your neighbors to your food shed? Um, I've all given them a flyer. Owen's got a nice, beautiful flyer that I've, that I've handed out as I've given out some fresh fruit, and they, they all love the idea. Um, it's just a, a slow change, you know. It's just getting them to understand what more it's about. So um, their uh, immediate neighbors, they, they love it, but they're just they're not farmers and gardeners. <sighs> they have the, the, the guys come in on the day during and cut their yards and stuff, so. I collect all the mulch, though. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. So you're actually using their waste. Yeah, you got it. Yeah. So Carrie and Owen, do you want to add anything to um, our discussion with Jacob about food sheds and local food sheds? Again, it's it, it doesn't have to be um, this elitist movement that kind of alienates others. And, you know, especially there are a number of people who who don't have land or don't have the space to do things. And, and that's certainly not the, not the goal. Um, I think it's really just about people getting together and and kind of, you know, using what resources we have and thinking about ways to maximize those resources. Um, it's And it's really kind of about coming back to um, community self-sufficiency and not being so dependent upon, you know, where's our food coming from? And, you know, what, if, what, what, what would happen if suddenly that food source was cut off? And would we be powerless or would we be, you know, starving? You know, I mean, that's, that kind of thing is is something, and again, it's not necessarily the gloom and doom prophecy. I don't really subscribe to that. I think that, um, I think it's really about looking at, at simple, efficient ways of, of getting together and being proactive. 
And I, you know, I'd like to add, um, I think once people experience this and see how much fun it is, uh, I've heard it described as life-changing, and the experiences that people have are maybe unpredictable and go beyond the whole food situation. I'd also like to throw in the idea that this can then, uh, these, these little small neighborhood food sheds can then link out to related food sheds throughout the community. And one reason to do that is that there are different microclimates, particularly with the varied terrain that we have here. And that means that you can grow different things, say in the heat of the foothills, as opposed to the cooler weather of the Mesa or downtown or Goleta, uh, different soil types and so forth. And so we could be sharing out on a larger basis some of the surplus from our own neighborhoods when we have it. And, you know, another thing I like to own about your pamphlet or brochure is that you were talking about some of the ramifications or influence that the local food sheds could have. And one of those were training centers. Could you elaborate on that a bit? Yeah, that's another level that I'd like to see this taken to at some point. And that is that since most people have lost the ability to grow anything and they have the gardener come with the mower and the blower and the truck and they haul all the grass clippings away and really people have no relationship to land at all anymore. And it's only a couple generations ago, of course, that, uh, you know, our forebears were involved with agriculture in some way or another, at least for many of us. Um, we need to get the skill set back. And one way that I think we can do that is to take some of these many permaculture trained people and organic gardening trained people from our community and others and begin to use them as a resource where we could go around to the food sheds and do a little training, maybe even have a situation where those people could make a bit of a living off of this situation at some point um, by kicking down a little money to help pay their time and expenses. You know, I'm going to shut the door because we can hear Doc Jazz rolling the music carts. I don't know if the listeners can hear that. <laughs> he's searching for the wonderful music he's going to play in about 15 minutes. And in case you just tuned in, I'm Jill Cloutier for Sustainable World. And my guests today are Jacob Rodrigue, who's joining us by the, from the, on the phone, a certified permaculturist, gardening, and farming enthusiast who started a local food shed, Owen Dell, who is well-known in the community and star of the television series Garden Wise Guys, who also started a food shed, and Carrie Clough, a certified nutritional chef. And this is also KCSB 91.9 FM in Santa Barbara. So what we're talking about right now is neighborhood food sheds, how to start them, the benefits of them. And one thing that um, came up for me, Carrie, when you were talking about where does our food come from, and I don't know if either of you saw or all three of you saw the email from on the local food serve, and it was talking about where our food, the distribution, and where who owns what companies. Oh, yeah, that's a great, that's actually a really great um uh, resource to have uh, to see exactly how the whole uh, monopoly is working within the large scale um, like companies like General Mills and Heinz um, like General Mills owns Cascadian Farms and what was the other one? I know I was shocked I wish I'd printed it today. It's it's and it's like what I was mentioning earlier about um, the organic movement becoming kind of a marketing tool and and these big companies wanting to get on the bandwagon and then you know the quality will will de easily decline as a result of these and and again the the packaging remains the same so it's fooling people into thinking it's a free you know competitive market not a monopoly and it's those monopolies that we need to be be wary of and kind of kind of take some power back. And Heinz, I think they own um, Hain. Which yeah, is Hanson Sodas, is yeah, mm -hmm. which is huge. And then Coca-Cola, which was really shocking to me, I think owns Naked Juice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which was a, a strange, <laughs> an interesting marriage of interests. So let's get back to the food sheds. Um, oh, and one thing I loved in your pamphlet was one of the benefits. You listed some advantages of neighborhood food sheds. And number 14 cracked me up. It says there's no licenses, no permits, no inspections, no rules, no hearings, no corporations, no fees, contracts, no salespeople, no driving, no tiny annoying labels to peel off your fruit. <laughs> you don't need to ask anybody's permission. Just do it. And that was, that's great. <laughs> Just move, move into the nauseous fear and start to enjoy life. No, nobody can stop us. Nobody can say we can't grow food. Um, it's Not such an unbureaucratic, um, you know, sort of technologically zeroed out simple basic thing you need uh, a couple of hand tools and uh, a little bit of knowledge and that's about it and just it sounds like such a fun thing to do is get together socially how long do the food sheds usually last are they a couple hours well, about three hours usually on sundays from 11 to 2 I think the Burdettes is around that time, too, isn't it? Or yeah, they're on Sundays. They, they just do once a month, and I think they're about three hours, too. Mm -hmm. 
could you give our listeners, tell them where these are located and how they would get involved? Well, I guess you have to actually be in that neighborhood, but if they wanted to come and, and maybe sit in and see what it's like to learn oh, how to Oh, do absolutely. This. I think people should definitely come and visit. Carrie, you want to give the address of yours? Well, um, Jacobs is at 661 Catania Way, and um, you could probably map quest that, or um, it's, it's in Hidden Valley. Um, so anyone in that area who's listening right now could easily, you know, walk to the food shed or, or um, you know, we've actually been started putting up signs that kind of indicate, you know, it's this way. <laughs> that's a, you know, if that's um, something that, you know, the neighborhood around there is just, is listening, tuning into, then I think that's really, it's great. So come on by. It's not just food, though, too. I mean, I, I didn't hear the whole interview either, but it's also, you know, plants and seeds and ideas. Exactly. So, so you could actually bring seeds and plants that you have and share those as well? Oh, yeah. Wow, that is really cool. So that's a good way to also, so you're kind of cutting out the seed companies in a way, which it's good to support some of them, but it's great just to share seeds with your neighbors. Yeah, you know, it's the open pollination, so you're going to have a stronger seed source. Okay, so what um, what about the Mesa food shed, Owen? Yeah, the Mesa one is once a month, and I think it's the, I want to say the third Sunday, um, but I'd have to verify that. In any case, once a month, and it floats. It goes from one house to another, and um, I'd love to have people come by wherever you're from, and it's okay to drive. We won't look down our noses at you. Just this you won't one be shunned time. at the food shed? Nah, yeah, we're pretty open-minded. Um, and see what it's like, and then go back and do one in your own neighborhood. That's really the key to it, because as I say, I think once people see how much of a kick this is, and how enjoyable it is just to hang out with neat people who talk about food and, and grab a peach right off the table and eat it and, you know, enjoy the moment. I just think they'll be hooked. Yeah. I've been full the last few food shows. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and full, full of wonderful food. You know, Carrie brought a bag of produce this morning. And Carrie, where did that produce come from? Actually, it's just all a, um, accrued from the last food shed. It so is, there's it's gorgeous. And actually, the peaches are from Jacob's Tree, and then the blood oranges were brought by um, um, an, another woman from Goleta. Oh, it's wonderful. It's those oranges and lemons, um, those inspiring oranges and lemons, and then some peaches. So that those look wonderful in there. Does it have to be, what if someone in your neighborhood does not grow organically? Can they still be part of the food shed? Well, yeah, that's a that's a good point. I, I don't, again, it's, it's really not about elitism. I think that... Um, you know, some people are, are practicing methods that have been tried and true for them, and they, they just don't really question it if they're using harsh chemicals or miracle Grow or whatever. And, you know, but it's really not about excluding those people or making them, them feel bad, but it's, it also is presenting a, a forum of, of other alternatives and thinking, you know, well, what, what's actually helping? What, what, are we producing a high yield for this short period of time? And then what happens to the soil? You know, there's, there's plenty of people around town that are fairly knowledgeable, Owen included, um, that can advise you about, you know, what, you know, what the alternative alternatives are to such methods. We, we would welcome those people, but um, I have to say we would have to have a large red P tattooed on their forehead for pesticides. <laughs> And then a like big the R for Roundup. Yeah, yeah. Other than that, they're perfectly welcome. <laughs> but we love you anyway. Of course we do. We love everybody, actually. It's all, you know what? I, I, for me personally, it's been just great. I've had plants. I've had seeds. It doesn't really matter. You know, it's, it's about bringing back community, bringing back, taking back what was rightfully ours to begin with. Well which, said. Which right. almost seems revolutionary to people, but really it's just a fundamental human right, right? I mean, it's... You know, the word that's been taught, that's been thrown about a lot lately, um, maybe because of that movie, The Secret, or, you know, other, but the word abundance. And I really think that it's amazing when you open up your mind, and, and especially into sharing, you're opening up your heart in some way. You're kind of opening the doors to, to possibilities, to community, and it's amazing what happens. And opening your mouth to all that wonderful food. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like I said, I walk out of there stuff. <laughs> You know, I just, I just want to say, to, uh, I really liked what you said, Jacob, uh, taking back what is really ours to begin with. We have this land. Uh, why are we squandering it in this silly way? And uh, it's so easy to turn it around. Even a couple fruit trees can produce so much food, and it's so easy to do. 
And I think what's it, we, I was at Lyndon Larry Saltzman Backyard Food Forest last Sunday, and that is very inspiring. They do have classes there, I think, once or twice a year on how to, to build a backyard food forest in your own neighborhood. It's so inspiring. And, and they have a strip of land. Their, their lawn is probably about six feet long now, long now. They keep cutting away at the lawn and putting in edibles. So that I might have to go back and do another show with them because it's so inspiring to see how much food you actually can grow on a small property. His yard is, is definitely inspiring, that's for sure. That's what definitely got me kicked up. Larry and Linda are just um, gems in the community. I mean, they are really in, integral parts of this community and offer so much, and I'm, I'm really thankful for them. Let's get some contact information from all of you, so in case our listeners would like to get involved, let's start with Owen. How would someone um, contact you and or the Food Shed? Well, first of all, um, feel free to contact me. I can be reached at my email address, which is O-D-E-L-L at silcom, S-I-L-C-O-M dot com, uh, or through my website, which is www.oendell.com. Um, and I can email you over a PDF of this brochure that I have, and then you can distribute that, and print it out, and distribute it however you want. Um, the Mesa food shed, or I think they call it the Mesa Exchange website, is really neat. They've done a beautiful job on it. And uh, so get your pencils out, because this, this, is, <laughs> this is pretty ponderous. <laughs> HTTP colon slash slash web.mac.com vieja oh, slash, backslash, backslash. vieja valley, that's <laughs> V-I-E-J-A V-A-L-L-E-Y slash iweb slash <laughs> this gets worse. <laughs> Mesa percent 20 exchange slash welcome dot HTML. Why is it so I'm not long? repeating that. I have no idea. But, uh, Maybe you, you could send that link out to the Organic Garden Group and whoever yeah. wants to forward yeah. it out further. Or email me and I'll send you the link. But yeah, there, it's, a, it's a neat website. It's very pretty. It has a lot of information on it. Uh, I think they've even got a blog on there now, so it's a pretty neat site. And then, of course, too, there's um, the Santa Barbara Food Future Listserv, Santa Barbara Organic Gardening Listserv. Uh, there's a permaculture Google group. There's all kinds of things going on in the community about food. Mm -hmm. And what about you, Carrie? What about your contact information? Um, you can reach me at www.manzanitachef.com, and that's M-A-N-Z-A-N-I-T-A chef c-h-e-f dot com also there's some good maybe Owen you want to read those websites um, like uh, eat the suburbs dot org is a great website and it just if anyone's interested in what um, other people are doing and then there's the San the San Luis one I don't know if, oh yeah here it is yeah. uh, neighborhood produce dot org and then there's also a great um, there's a great website called um, food not lawns I'm pretty sure that's a dot org it might be a dot com um, that's a great, just, you know, another way of looking at kind of taking, subverting the whole lawn model and turning into something different. It was after Mark Lakeman's talk. It was, it was Portland, Oregon. Look into that, what they're doing up there, too. Oh, cityrepair.org city repair, is good, good, too. Yeah. Now, Jacob, what about contact information for you? Uh, for me, oh, um, uh, skate, uh, 2x4, like S-K-A-T-E, mm -hmm. 2x4. At Hotmail. Okay, and that's your email, so people could contact you if they have questions and they want to hear how you've done this. Yeah, yeah. How I did this? I threw a card table up, put chairs on. <laughs> <laughs> but he'll so, train you in that complex <laughs> process. No, and charge? <laughs> <laughs> There's a whole training program? Yeah, and then, you know what? As it evolved, we used to just put it out there, and then actually we got some basket, and it like, started looking pretty. <laughs> Got some, there's a lot of good literature. I have a lot of good literature, that's for sure. That is so cool. It sounds really, really fun. Yeah, so when are you coming by? Yeah. <laughs> well, I told Carrie, at, I saw, met. I actually met Carrie a while ago, and then I saw her again at a meeting a couple weeks ago, and I said, well, I haven't come because, I, like I said before, all I have is agapanthus. Uh, well, like, like Carrie said, there's so much fruit and stuff that is, you walk away full and walk away with the basket. Yeah, don't, yeah. And, and I won't bring worry. the agapanthus. Otherwise, it just gets composted. <laughs> You know, the, the first uh, food share that happened on the Mesa, um, Doug told me they had so much food left over at the end of it, they took it down and gave it to the food bank. Oh, that's yeah. great. Because it was just the abundance that we have, and we don't really even realize it. And when you gather it up and you put it in one place, it's an amazing sight. Uh, at Carrie and Jacobs the other day, someone came with two huge boxes of delicious plums. And, I mean, it was way more than any of us could eat. And I gave out. <laughs> 
plums to probably 10 people. Me too. <laughs> it spreads out. You know. Yeah. And if, you know, there's plenty of, I mean, if you're worried about fruit spoiling, you can always, you know, freeze it or um, make it into sauces. I mean, it just depends or on pies. how crafty you want to get. <laughs> or pies. Yeah. Thank you so much, all of you, for joining me today. Yes. Thanks for having us, Jill. Thank you. It's been great. And you've been listening to Sustainable World. I'll be back next week and have fun starting your own food shed. Thanks for tuning in. Bye-bye. You've been listening to a Sustainable World Radio podcast. For more information or to hear our other podcasts or interviews, visit www.sustainableworldradio.com. Sustainable World Radio is produced by Jill Cloutier. Music by Dana Lyons. Thanks for listening. Thank you.